Today we've got a really special guest dropping in at Ombi headquarters. His name is Mark Visser. Having Mark here after seeing all his accomplishments was absolutely fantastic. He's trained with guys like Kelly Slater, Kai Lenny. He's trained Navy SEALs, the Australian SAS. He's a author and a keynote speaker who talks about mindset. The guy has got an absolutely lethal backhand. He's surfed all the big wave events and he's been a run up numerous of times. He even surfed Jaws at night. So me personally, I don't want to surf Jaws. It scares the living crap out of me. Jumping off the rocks, padding out into like 40 foot waves, doing it at night, absolutely next level. But we spoke a lot about the effects of fear and how to deal with it. Later on, we got him on the skate ramp, which he'd never done before, which was quite exciting for me because I could see he was a bit nervous. To see him go through the freeze, flight and fight, but how well he dealt with it and how quickly he mastered it, shows what a champion he is. The, the guy's an absolute unit who believes in a lot of hard work and he backs himself. So to have him here today has been an absolute honor and a privilege. And yeah, let's introduce you to Mark. As a kid, I was diagnosed with optical dyslexia. So they gave me optical like, dyslexia. yeah, they gave me like little green lens glasses because yeah, right. every time I read shit, it just doesn't make sense. Or I'd miss words out and, I'd, yep. and if I wrote it down, I'd write it down with the words missing and then read it with them back in there. No yeah, yeah. So for me to write a book was um, was a good challenge. <laughs> I could never like write a book. Hey? I, 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 well, I, work I could with make like, a scrapbook, but not a book. <laughs> well, I work with like it took about a year. Okay. And I work with like a different writer, so she would then go through what I've written and then just basically say to me, "All right, what about this part? You know, like okay. let's just flesh that out." Yeah, a bit that's more. helpful. Hey? So that, I was doing that, and that that was that was helpful. But I spent. Um, and a lot of people probably don't know, but I spent a lot of time, like I did, I've done nearly 21 years of kinesiology in that space, yeah, and I went and worked with a lady in the forest in, in Bali in Ubud for about a year. She was like a coach and another chick just on like one section of the brain, she was from India. Yep. She's like 14 years in that. So I spent a lot of time in that space because I was always afraid and I was yep. like, how am I going to get on top of this? Well, I wanted to ask you because, I mean, writing a book's is a daunting thing. Yeah. But then also you're doing um, like public speaking, yeah, which is like a whole other different type of fear. But but probably it it's it's not there's no physical there's no lion jumping out of the bush, mm. but it's probably more scary. Yeah, it is at first. Um, but in saying that, like I kind of felt like I was different from the start. Like I yep. kind of went, I love surfing, but I kind of feel like um, there's a part of it where it was the first time I actually went to Namotu in Fiji. We were on a surf trip and I was telling someone something like, oh, if you do this, this and this, there's no different to any coach, this will stop you from eating shit or being um, held down, you know, it yep. was something like that. And then anyway, the next day we're at lunch because every day, you know, at Nomoto, you're sitting around and you're mingling with everyone and they said, oh, I got held down, this happened, I did exactly what you said, saved my life and he like, he's quite emotional about it. And he's like, man, you really got to tell other people the things that you told me because you know, that just saved me. And if I didn't do that, I don't know what would happen. And yeah. and it was kind of those things take away the fear of the reality of, oh, I'm talking to people, it's uncomfortable, it's awkward, knowing that, well, I'm actually helping a shitload of people. Yeah. So then the fear of that went away because you're like, well, what's the bigger picture? Um, I suppose if it was for something else and you're presenting on a topic that you didn't know, then that's overwhelming because you don't know your stuff, I suppose. But when you genuinely are talking about something that you know will help someone, I feel different about it. Like, I'm like, this will help you. This is good. <laughs> so, so question then. The reason why I'm asking this question is I watched um, an episode of the Twiggy, um, Grant Baker. Yeah. So I, I know Grant because we're both South yeah. Africans. And, yeah, yeah. And um, he was like, if, if he wasn't winning an event, he wouldn't surf the next one. It was almost like his motivation to make some money was, his, was one of his driving factors. Yeah. Um, plus, he was always calmer in big waves. Like, I'd be surfing with him and just absolutely shitting myself and he's like giggling yeah i've seen him like that I yeah actually, i remember the first time i surfed um i think it was um phantoms with him and he yeah. was looking at me and he had a like he could tell i was i was scared and intimidated and he was loving the fact that i was <laughs> yeah like he's you can see it bubbling yeah. out of him eh? yeah but in the sense that's quite calming as well because you're like okay if he's like that maybe i should calm down so mm. it's a bit of a like a mirror effect 
and it sort of um, can change the mood of other people. So I don't know if he, if he does it for that reason or not, but it can work out to help others. Well, it looked like he was genuinely enjoying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where like he's, he had like a calm heart, right, where mine was just through the roof. <laughs> but um, yeah, the reason why I said that, what, what made you surf bigger ways? Is it, like, is it imposter syndrome? Who did you have to prove it to? Mm. Why? What, what is going on? Probably trying to prove it to myself. Um, so as a kid, I was born on, the, on a farm, like countryside, and uh, grew up afraid of the water. When I was young, I nearly drowned. I was eating a peach, and I dropped it in a sheep's trough and dove in after it. And then, um, yeah, brother pulled me out by my hair, and apparently I wouldn't have a bath for like a year after. Didn't learn to swim properly till after 10. Yep. So then grew up on the sunny coast always being like you know doing fake paddling oh this is you know so it's my set you know, so it's oh, a back paddle it. yeah. <laughs> but just was just genuinely afraid and then even when um like i i started getting better at surfing and doing contests i was still i reckon still afraid for sure and the first time i went to hawaii like all those things were i was always afraid i would do i'd still deal with it and still go out there but I would say that, you know, when I was sitting next to someone else in the same situation, I was way more like um, struggling than, you know, I would have been going through so much more than they would have internally. And, you know, so I just really wanted to get over that and I wanted to prove to myself that I had gotten over it. And that was the point of doing it. A lot of the things that I did that were quite different was I was searching for a way to prove like beyond a shadow of doubt that I am not afraid anymore. Um, and that's and that's what I was searching for. And where does that come from? That probably stems from, you know, a lack of um, high self worth, self love. Because if you had that, you don't need to prove that. Um, so I look back on that and go, you know what? Had I've had a, a healthier self worth, I probably didn't need to do some of the really dangerous shit that I did <laughs> to so prove to myself. At night at Jaws. Yeah, like surfing at Jaws at night. Well, that that was purely to do that to prove, okay, that would beyond a shadow of doubt would prove that I've gotten over it. And I look back on that one and that was actually what I was referring to. It's like, had I had a just a, a healthier self-worth, I think I would have just been able to process that differently and went, you know, you don't need to do that. I was totally fear of failure, fear of everything. And it was consumed by it completely. And I was doing whatever I could to, to win at all costs, which is, a toxic formula going forward because you you sacrifice and you destroy so much in the lead up to doing that. Yep. Um, I was going to say I was going to ask something. Yeah, go for was, it. when you were saying about the QAs and stuff, you when you were in the QAs kind of thing, did you guys get surfed? So I started before it was even the QS was was the ASP. And then yeah. Yeah. I think when I fell off, it like it changed over, and then they're doing the QS and qualifying and all that stuff. Yeah. It was. It was the year when Taj Burrows kind of qualified and then he decided not to do it and then he qualified the following year. So it was, oh, yeah. it was kind of way back then. Yeah. So I, I don't think we're at the same time. Oh, I think when I was there, it was ASP too. And then WSL yeah. has yeah. been around forever. Oh, okay. All yeah. Right. But yeah, I, my competitive background, I pretty well sucked, I'd say. <laughs> and I was just, I love surfing and I wanted to, I just knew deep down oh, I'd love to be able to compete and travel the world and then when I was doing that I think I found myself more often than not going oh look at the conditions this is crap call it off yeah you know whereas I think if I had the competitive side of it knowing that oh, I can actually perform really well in these you know shin high waves I should have been going let it run you know I'm pumped for it whereas my mindset was so different you, you know it's different so my um, my background coming from South Africa my parents didn't have a lot of money but I was a diabetic and when I should have gone to army and did military service, they said, okay, take the year off and go surfing. So I ended up going to Australia, surfing some QSs and stuff. And I put so much pressure on myself to try surf well that I, um, the fear of losing made me freeze. And oh yeah, me too. I would so, have lived that path for sure. Yeah, so yeah. exactly. So I suppose the interesting thing is that fear takes so many different forms and shapes and, um, it's debilitating, but when you kind of learn how to deal with it and learn what emotions you're going through and which ones are good and which are bad and what you can affect and stuff, it's, it's um, not only kind of be motivation, but um, it can also help you get to know yourself so much better. Um, yeah, I, I almost wish I could go back 20 years, whatever it was, and go back and have another crack at it, knowing what I know now. Mm. 
Mm, it's exciting. Yeah. yeah, I think things like that too, but then I think, well, you probably wouldn't be the coach that you are today had you have not done that, you know, had this, you know, so you got to kind of go, it's always a bit of a different path that it was possibly meant to be. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I don't uh, disagree with that at all. This is a big question that I wanted to pose to you is someone may not see the potential in themselves, but you might see the potential in them. Mm. Like you could, you might know, okay, if someone can do X, he might be able to increase his breath hold by whatever component that might be. But you're pushing them out of their comfort zone and, and guiding them through that. I suppose that that's what a good coach does is takes someone out of their comfort zone and helps them to see their potential and, and meet their potential. But you've been able to do that in the realm of, of big wave surfing. So I can understand that someone has to want to take that leap of faith to do big waves. But now you've flipped that around and now you're helping people in their everyday lives with a similar approach. So how do you help someone reach their potential? What is that for you? I think personally, this is just my opinion, is, uh, and I really think it's people are on their own journey and they're going to have their own way of seeing things. If I try and mould anyone into the way I see it, it's going to be rigid in a sense, whereas I have to more so be an example of a way that I've done it. And if something connects with that and they see that, oh, that could work for me, that's going to help. Whereas if I try and let's say I'm at an event and I'm speaking to a, um, a group of high level bankers. I don't know their world as well as they do. And if I tried to explain to them what they need to do, um, you're going to get pushback. So you need to be able to be humble in a sense where you could say, this is how I've approached things. And if they can see the same similarities, that's when you can really help someone. Um, and I think you have to be able to approach it from a way of this is what's worked for me and this is an example um, versus this is the only way and this is what you have to do. So that, that's quite profound that you, what you've said because that means that there's no ego right there. Yeah. You, you've actually taken the ego out of your learning and then trying to get people just to see it for what it is. Is that something that you got from your time doing kinesiology and, and that? It's something I got from having a big ego, <laughs> like myself, as in seeing that going, you know, like this, like as a human, I would say, I was someone that's just like, all right, there's a gate, I'll smash that gate down. You know, that was my approach. It was a very bravo way of doing things. And then you learn, you know, constantly, that might not be the best way to get from A to B. You know, and, and it's only from constantly slamming your head against that gate that you learn and realise that. And yeah, working in the space of kinesiology now for over 21 years, I'm always picking up on why certain things aren't happening and why there's blocks and then sitting back and then asking and then re, re, reframing or readdressing the same situation but with a different approach. Uh, and then when you understand that, you, you really have to take your ego out of everything because um, if you ever try and force any situation, it's like you can't predict the future, right? Yeah. You know, like if I work with a football team, like if we want to win the game, well, we can't talk about winning the game because there's a certain amount of halves or quarters in that game. And then we can't talk about winning the half because we need to win the first part of it. So you have to just keep bringing everything back to like right now. And if you are ever a step ahead of time, then you're out of the game. You know, so like as soon as I, you know, start trying to control things or predicting what I want to happen, um, I can lead it to an example of where I think it will go, but I need to be um, moldable in that sense because I have to respect each person in the way they want to see it or shape it. And then they could be um, tapped out at a certain point and then we go, cool, we'll just leave it there for now. Um, so that's their journey. So you mentioned that someone's tapped out. What does that look like? Well, then they're consumed by fear, I believe. You know, like, or they've they're hit a point where they can't retain any more information. Mm -hmm. So that's when they need to be able to, um, like I said, my opinion, stop, just reassess, get a better understanding of what they know to this point and be able to come back to it again because the rest is just, you know, you're just doing junk miles, you know. So when I, I, I 
I kind of dangled the carrot for you and said, let's go on this gate around. You said, okay, I'll take a look at it. If it's out of my league, I'm not going to do it. Well, I just said, I'll just take a look at it, yeah. Yeah, but, <laughs> but that's exactly what you're talking about with, with someone tapping out. I think some people don't know when to say, okay, that's enough for me for now. Mm. And Yeah, I think it's being comfortable with being yourself. Like when you said that to me, a great example of that would be the old me would be like, sure, I'll do it. You know, like as in <laughs> zero regard. I don't, I don't know what you got back there, you know, and I don't, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not, I don't, I don't even know what it is. So I'm not going to say that. I'll just say, oh, I'll have a look at it and go from there. Yeah. So like right away, I'm just clear to set any expectation of, well, I'll just take that one step at a time. It, it, it's really interesting because <laughs> that, that's really powerful. Because what I say to some people when, they, when they're surfing is that a wave will come through and they'll just outright go no without even looking at it. And I said to them, there's this little word called maybe, like have a look at it. Mm. And while you're having a look at it, you may see a possibility and you may see um, potential. And then suddenly that, that maybe starts edging towards yes. And then you, your, um, kind of your, your energy starts heading in that direction. And then you're like, okay, I'll have a go. And then that mm. no became a yes because of the word maybe. Mm. Um, so. Yeah, I didn't sort of say yes or no. That's why I kind of did that on purpose was just, well, I'll have a look at it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a polite way of just saying, I'll make my mind up when I get there. So let's go big wave surfing. <laughs> you, you had a yeah. new spot. Yeah. You have to have a look at it and then you have to pull the trigger. Mm. All right. Um, when it comes to pulling the trigger, is it just your, your background and your training that, that gives you the confidence to, to do that? It would be one part of it. Um, so when I rock up to a big wave spot, let's use Piahi Jaws for an example. Um, no matter how many times I've surfed it, if it's been a while, like, you know, you're literally coming from waist high waves on the Gold Coast or Sunshine Coast or wherever that is, and I rock up and it's 50 to 60 foot, you know, like I on purpose will just try and um, spend a bit of time to get my, my, my energy, like just make sure I, I'll sit there, I'll sit in the lineup, I'll be the furthest one back, I'll sit and wait, I just want to watch what's going on. I used to just always just go straight out and then um, and I would just take off and then I would get hurt or stupid shit would happen uh, or do silly things or make um, uncalculated decisions. And then over the years, but I mean, it's been a long time since I've ever acted like that. Um, I would just sit and wait and just take my time. I'd be okay with not catching a wave for an hour, two hours, and then just, just watch what's going on. And then from the training that I've done, knowing, okay, I can see what where people are taking off. I can see where you're going. What are the potential situations if I went down? And then I know how would I deal with that? Where are the exits? I just kind of start mapping out a plan. I'm not really mapping it out as far as like strategically, but I'm just sort of assessing going, can I deal with that? Have I dealt with that before? No worries. Calculated risk. Yeah. And then when it comes to taking off, especially even you could be out there riding new boards and yeah. in the big wave world, that's something that I've found really tricky is you go to a new spot and then you're riding a new board with someone's idea of what they think is going to work and um and with shapers that can be that can be frustrating yeah you know because you're a guinea pig and then you keep eating shit and they're like yeah oh, i'll just try this and you're like yeah don't try that because i just got a stiff neck now for the next month or whatever but um yeah for me i just take my time and just sort of work my way into it and be okay with that process because i used to think that that was a weakness i used to think yeah. that uh because I straight away haven't got a bomb or haven't just gone straight into it that I'm that I'm not you know cool enough or whatever yeah. that was you're a lesser person because yeah. um, and, you're edging your way in <laughs> yeah and then I just went no I'm actually this is a smarter way to do it and when I get there and I'm comfortable taking off well then I'm, I can feel confident to do that again and again uh, but that, that's happened a lot where, you know, and then friends, I'd be out at places like Piahi and then friends from Australia would go, wow, you know, you took off from that spot and, you know, that was awesome. Bec you know, but, and a lot of the uh, international guys that didn't live there weren't taking off from those spots. And I wasn't getting bowed or anything on my backhand or anything like that, but I just picked a good line and it was from having the ability to sit and watch and wait and, and pay attention to that, you know, and say, okay, every every hour that like one in every whatever sets is a wide one and it's got a better shape on it and you can actually get pick a better line and and that's how i got those good waves yeah no it's level of commitments next level <laughs> yeah but yeah in that space like i'm, I'm you know I, i'm not someone that's 
demanding attention or um, or, or deserving it in that space of you know like falling out of the lip backwards and then you know pulling in with a second's notice I, I don't really feel like I've done the time to sort of do that there you know like a lot of the times even if there's 50 dudes on the right I'll go surf the left and there'll be four of us um, I just like catching waves and for me if I'm like I've flown all the way over here I can sure the right's probably going to be a better wave and if I get a sick one it's probably going to be more credible or I can get a lot of lefts and have a lot of fun I'm actually going to probably lean towards that yeah. you know um, a younger version of me would be probably thinking differently. Yeah, so you're surfing for yourself, not your ego. Yeah, and I used to, well, because I was always, I hadn't experienced those things, so I was trying to um, prove that I could. And, there, and there, you got to also say, you know, although I'm trying to prove it to myself, there is that element of trying to prove it to your sponsors and things like that, because mm. um, I'm a hard worker as an individual. You know, like if I was on a job site or doing anything, if someone's paying me to do something, I'm gonna I'm gonna work hard. And when you're there as a as a sponsored surfer, they're wanting you to get good shots, and they want to use that for their marketing. And if you get if you don't get anything, they're they're kind of like, well, why are we paying you? So I would see that some people would say, oh, that's possibly selling out because you're doing it to get photos. But the way I'd look at it is, oh, I'm a hard worker, and I'm doing it because I respect the company that's taking the time to back me in. And I would feel like a bludger that if I just went out there and took their money and didn't um, give it a go. You know, I signed up for it, so that's 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 what I'm actually doing. But I definitely don't miss um, going surfing at certain spots and having to take off further down, the, like in different spots, just to link up with a cameraman. Like yeah. I, I love just being able to go setting surfing. up the shot. Yeah, but yeah. You, but in saying that, like um, I am a worker, and and I will do what I got to do to help. The people that are helping me yeah so i see that as being grateful and i see that as being um, respectful to a company or someone that's paying you but yeah I, i'd love going on trips now you know where if i'm at cloud break or wherever just going surfing and getting bowed and i don't give two shits who caught what or if it's overcast i don't care i'm like great you know yeah. um and like there were so many things like oh because i was the guy that often just went everything all the time and I used to have camera guys say to me, stop, you gotta like think about where I am and don't bother going ones until I'm in position. So I, I'm a, I was quick at adapting, but then it was like, this isn't as fun, you know? So yeah. as soon as I didn't have to do that, I was like, oh, this is great. That's my, just... my brother's a photographer, so I've had the same thing. Yeah, right. I was like, come on, let's line the shot up. And then you line it up and someone goes and you inside and takes it and you just waited 20 minutes for that shot. It's like, oh. Or even it's pulling in and like, you wanna keep going down and surf the wave but like, no no pull off the, once you pass the camera and pull off and come back yeah. and do it again yeah and it was like took, took the fun out of it but then like i said i totally respect the job element of it yeah. and when i see people say to someone oh that person only does this for that i go a different perspective is that, that person's actually a hard worker and they're doing yeah. their job so if you could look at it like if i look at it from that perspective i kind of change my view when i hear people saying that about someone I go, oh, nah, I kind of, I, I think all, the best way to look at it is if you had the money and you were paying um, some individual to get you things that you needed for your products and marketing it, and one kid's doing exactly what he needs and the other one's just really content and happy to just catch it whenever he feels right, you'd be like, I appreciate you staying true to yourself, but this is a shit business model and, yeah. and this is costing me a lot of money because we're sending you on all these trips and you're having a great time working in your own space but um so that that pressure of needing to work um comes in too <laughs> yeah. oh no great hey i'm really keen to uh get you on the ramp and then yeah. go i'll go have a look yeah it's up at the bottom yeah so, so you want me to go back in first yeah just just i'm look. holding the board so i can't roll oh, yeah. i'll try and roll yeah. and just see how it actually feels it feels to, I, I can't even ride a skateboard I haven't ridden one you're just leaning in Oh, shit. <laughs> Fantastic, that's good. That's what I wanted to see. All right, so you're, you're trying to pivot and turn everything off the back foot. Yeah, I'm a heavy back foot surfer. Okay. Um, so but uh, honestly, I don't think, I can't, I think the last time I rode a skateboard, I might have been 14. Right, so let's show you an easy way of doing this. <laughs> Feel, okay, if so I just your press off foot, the front foot, that, that on, actually gets yeah, me speed. On yeah. every down, push down, Yeah. push down, front foot, push down, push down. Keep that hand up. This push hand? Push down, this one. This one? Yep. Push down, push down, 
push down it's hard because i just want to get to go up and hit it <laughs> it wasn't bad but the reason why i like it is that in in boxing or kickboxing or anything else mm. if you haven't got your hands up and the coach goes get your hand up and you get a blood nose straight away what's the first thing you do Keep your hands up. boom so it sharpens up your learning curve really fast because <laughs> there's a consequence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and it makes you pay attention. Yeah. Whereas in the water, you fall off, you're like, oh, it was a bad wave, it was yeah. this, yeah, it was yeah. that. And you just lay the blame all the time. Sure. So this is one way where, um, because there's that, that fear is in the background, if you can just keep it as the backseat driver and not give it the wheel and not let it drive, mm. um, you can be mindful of it, mm. but then deal with it and do what you want to do. And then it's, yeah, it's fun. Cool. Awesome, man. Yeah. Pleasure.